Hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. This is the channel where we share educational information on Long COVID to help you understand your symptoms better. So if you want to have answers on today's topic, please watch this talk from start to finish because we will help you to learn more. And just very quickly, if you are new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button because I can help you to get answers relevant to your symptoms. And don't forget to get a video a like because this tells me that these videos are useful. And at the same time, it motivates me to create more content for you. Thank you very much. And let's jump straight into our interview. Hello and welcome back to Long COVID Foundation channel. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Leo Gallant. Dr. Gallant is a board certified internist and practicing in New York City, who is recognized as a world leader in functional and integrative medicine. Author of numerous books on diet allergy solutions, indigestion problems, regularly chosen by New York Magazine as one of the best doctors in New York. So, Dr. Galan, thank you very much for being with us, and it's such a great honor to have you on our channel. Uh, well, it's really um, good to be speaking with you again, and uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the information that I've learned uh, with your viewers. Thank you. So today we have a very complex topic to discuss. So many of our listeners are waiting to hear about what COVID can do to gut health and microbiome. Many say that COVID had major changes to food they can tolerate, weight loss or sometimes weight gain. Some experience severe GI issues, constipation or diarrhea. And unfortunately, there is no simple answer from general practitioners on what are the main post-COVID causes for this to happen. Uh, so I and our listeners would really love to hear your perspective on how COVID affects the gut and for how long gut can continue to be under COVID impact. Okay. Well, my perspective is based on the research that's been done and published. And most of the research has been done in hospitalized patients and, um, and has followed them for um, a few months afterwards. And we knew, do know that there are changes in the gut microbiome of those patients that persist. And what's interesting is that those changes are very similar to the changes that have been described in stool specimens from people who have CFSME. So that even though there are many ways in which long COVID is distinct from other post-viral syndromes, when it comes to the gut microbiome, uh, the results are quite comparable. And that is also true for the oral microbiome. So I, there are a lot of questions about the microbiome that people have, but I think it's important to have a basic understanding of the complexity of the microbiome. Let me just share some basic information about this. All right, okay, so we'll start with this. And I've included the oral microbiome in this presentation because there's a lot, the data indicates that the microbes growing in your mouth are possibly as important maybe even more important than the microbes in the gut when it comes to long COVID and the impact of COVID and the influence of the microbiome on the duration of symptoms. The microbiome covers every millimeter of every surface of our bodies inside and out. Skin, nose, mouth, throat, ears, lungs, genitals, and the GI tract. In fact, there's one interesting study looking at the microbiome in the nose in people who are acutely ill with COVID, which found that people who lacked bacteria in their nose had worse COVID. So there actually is a protective effect of the nasal microbiome. They didn't really get to the specific organisms. The function of the microbiome in the body um, has been compared to a bioreactor that is programmed to synthesize molecules that direct your human immune system, modify the expression of your genes, and regulate your metabolism. 
And over 90% of the chemicals that circulate in your blood originate with your microbiome, mostly the gut microbiome. Um, I've thought in the course of my work that our dependence on a microbiome really has a larger meaning. We're not solitary creatures. We are complex ecosystems. And so our sense of individuality is an illusion. Our personal ecosystems are constantly engaging with all the ecosystems we encounter and may, many that we don't know we encounter. So your microbiome is like your own personal cloud. It goes with you and is shed wherever you go. And forensic scientists can tell who was in a room by examining the bacterial DNA in that room. That's how individual it is. Now, there are many factors that shape your unique microbiome. There's diet, there's hygiene, there's the environment, which is very important. The people you live with, pets, the place in which you live, your culture. There are, horm there are influences of hormones and stress and exercise. Your personal medical history may have a strong impact, especially the presence of the use of medications and diseases. Early life experiences, including whether you, how you were born and the way you were fed as an infant. Personal genetics accounts for about 20 to 30% of the variability. So it's important to understand if you're dealing with long COVID that the microbiome in COVID-19 is not just about COVID-19. And in virtually all of the microbiome studies that have been done about anything, the differences between individuals are often more pronounced than the differences between a control population and a population with a particular condition that's being studied. Now, the gut microbiome is your body's largest and most diverse ecosystem, followed by the mouth. And in terms of the gut, about 95% of the total um, microbiome exists there. And there are more microbial cells in your gut than there are human cells in your whole body. Um, so basically, the small and large intestines have different functions and it may be important to recognize that. Uh, the small intestine is the main site of digestion and absorption of nutrients. It also secretes fluids and it contains about two thirds of your immune system. COVID-19 can have a major impact on the small intestine because the small intestine is a site of amino acid absorption and the impact of COVID-19 can be to interfere with the absorption of amino acids into your body. It especially can impact tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid. And the result of tryptophan malabsorption may be changes in mood in your nervous system and, the, and also impairment of immune function, which is regulated in the small intestine. So this is a very important effect. In the large intestine, uh, which is about five feet long, um, that's a place where fluid is absorbed. If you have diarrhea, you're not absorbing fluid well, and that may reflect damage to the lining of the, of the large intestine due to COVID. This is the main place where the bacteria live, and it is the main location for bacterial fermentation and metabolism. Okay, now this is, does not want to, oh, there we go, okay. So the lining of the small intestine is like a high pile car carpet. It's covered with hair-like projections called villi, and the villi are each covered with microvilli. This creates an immense surface area, the size of a doubles tennis court. There are many levels to the intestinal wall, and if you are interested in understanding the microbiome, What's important to recognize is that most of the bacteria there are attached to the lining cells. They don't even appear in the stool. So if you do a stool test, you're only getting a small sample of what's actually there. And there are many bacteria found in the opening called the lumen, and they will be excreted in stool. But many more 
and some of the more important ones are directly attached to this lining and don't get shed. So there are two conditions, two terms for conditions that are thrown around and are very important. The first is dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is an imbalance or instability among the many organisms of the microbiome that alters the ecosystem, creating undesirable effects on the health of the host. Leaky gut is a separate phenomenon. This is a decrease in the integrity of the intestinal lining, producing a state of hyperpermeability that allows toxins inside the gut to be readily absorbed into the body. Now, stress of any type can create dysbiosis and leaky gut. Stress hormones like adrenaline and noradrenaline selectively encourage the growth of some pathogenic bacteria, E. coli, for example. Adrenaline, in addition, can make bacteria like E. coli produce more toxins. The toxic bacteria then break down the intestinal barrier. The barrier breakdown or leakiness allows a greater penetration of these toxins into your body. Things like meditative practice and yoga can help to reverse this chain of events. Inflammation and the microbiome exist in a very complex relationship and inflammation and dysbiosis are a vicious cycle. And this is one of the reasons why probiotics may not work. They, they may not be able to take hold in an inflamed gut. See, inflammation leads to the release of a substance called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is part of the inflammatory response. Inflammation increases the concentration of nitric oxide, which then breaks down into nitrates in the inflamed tissue. A high nitrate environment changes bacterial growth patterns. And, it, and um, you may recall that uh, there have been bans placed on the use of detergents containing nitrates because they would get into the water supply and interfere with, um, with aquatic ecosystems. Well, the same thing happens in your GI tract or in your mouth when there's inflammation. You get a high nitrate environment. The anti-inflammatory bacteria are stunted, whereas pro-inflammatory bacteria that are very well adapted to growing in a high nitrate environment are stimulated. Their growth then creates more inflammation and maintains the high nitrate concentration. And that actually makes sense. If you thrive in an environment where there's high nitrates, you're gonna do what you can to supply yourself with nitrates. So that's an important piece of background to understanding the microbiome, how it's affected by COVID-19 um, and how it impacts on COVID-19. Now, there are two basic questions when you wanna look at the microbiome itself. And those are who's there and what do they do? Now, the who's there question. Um, there are a thousand different species of bacteria and it'll vary from person to person. And within those species, there are many more strains. There are viruses. These are mostly viruses called bacteriophages that live in bacteria. There are fungi, mostly yeasts, about 15 species. There are primitive bacteria-like organisms called archaea that produce methane. Uh, there are protozoa, which are one-celled tiny animals, and helminths that are worms. And most people in the world have all of these types of organisms. They are organized into what are called taxa and the sciences of taxonomy. And, and taxonomy was developed hundreds of years ago, but has been confirmed by DNA sequencing. And at the highest level, you have the kingdom, like the animal kingdom. And at the most specific level, you have the strain, which is um, with, exists within a species and within a genus, but there are many categories in between. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of complexity and diversity of this microbiome. Bacteria and archaea that look very much alike actually exist in separate kingdoms. Lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, which are similar probiotics, actually exist in separate phyla, and phyla are 
the broadest category under kingdoms. Humans and eels, by contrast, are in the same phylum. So that from a genetic perspective, lactobacilli and bifidobacteria have less in common with each other than humans do with eels. Um, and different strains of the same species may have divergent, even opposite effects. Um, this has been noted for Bacteroides fragilis, uh, one of the major organisms that most of us harbor in our gut. Now, diversity and balance create a healthy ecosystem. Health is usually associated with a greater variety of taxa at all levels. It's associated with a greater evenness in the richness of the different taxa. And groups of unrelated taxa support one another by creating independent feeding networks. And so the microbiome really consists of complex dynamic microbial communities, not a single community that interact with each other. Within this, there are species called keystone species, just as a keystone, keystone holds an arch together. These are major taxa that support other species to hold it all together. Now, COVID-19 impact, COVID impacts the gut microbiome the way that many other infections do. Um, for, first, it infects the small and large intestine, the virus that causes it. Um, and in the small intestine, as I mentioned, it can impair the immune response. People hospitalized with COVID-19 have a reduction in the diversity of bacterial species, a decrease in the anti-inflammatory taxa, and an increase in pro-inflammatory taxa as measured in stool tests and in mouth swabs. One organism that's been associated with a negative outcome in people hospitalized with COVID-19 is Enterococcus fecalis both in the mouth and in the stool. And that's a very powerful immune stimulating but pro-inflammatory bacterium. And it probably aggravates the cytokine storm of acute COVID. It's also been noted that species of yeast overgrow in people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 independently of whether they received antibiotics. So these abnormalities have been shown to persists for many weeks or even longer after the respiratory infection clears. And dysbiosis, especially in the mouth, is associated with the persistence of COVID symptoms. And what's seen in the mouth is the same pattern as in the stool. There's an increase in, in organisms that trigger an inflammatory response in the body. So for people with COVID-19, the most important depleted keynote species is an organism called Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. This is an anti-inflammatory species that produces butyrate. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid, which supports the growth of bifidobacteria, which is a whole genus of anti-inflammatory bacteria. Butyrate also nourishes the intestinal lining supplies 70% of energy for the lining of the large intestine, and it's absorbed systemically. And when it goes to the brain, it actually helps the brain recover from injury. So there's an important role for butyrate and the gut microbiome in, in dealing with the cognitive symptoms that can occur with long COVID. Now, probiotics Play, can play a special role. And I coined the term a few years ago, Alexander organisms. Alexander the Great um, is known for conquering a large part of the world, um, but he didn't do it by himself. He did it because he was able to organize and lead the Macedonian army. But without Alexander, that same army, which had been trained by his father, was just a local army. So pro Alexander organisms, are probiotics, they're strains or species that act as leaders and reorganize all the other taxa. Um, and some of the key Alexander organisms are lactobacilli, especially Lactobacillus plantarum, which is found in plants, Paracaceae, um, and Ruteri and Johnsoni, and they have different sources. Bifidobacteria can act as Alexander organisms. And within that group, the strain is more important than the species. 
there's a yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii, called yeast against yeast. Uh, that's what the French call it. They originally discovered and uh, produced it, but it was identified first in what was called French Indochina in the 1920s. And then there are soil derived organisms that are spore formers that are part of the bacillus species. And in the context of COVID-19, I found that one particular strain of bacillus subtilis called B7092 has been very helpful. So lactobacillus plantarum grows on plants. It's found in fermented vegetables like sauerkraut and kimchi. Uh, and there are supplements of it. Um, its main effect seems to be enhancing the immune response. Patients undergoing abdominal surgery given lactobacillus plantarum have fewer post-op infections. Um, now, there are some people who do not tolerate fermented foods following COVID-19. Um, in that case, you may have to get lactobacillus plantarum from a supplement. Um, and there may be several reasons for this intolerance, which I'll get into in a little while. Um, Bifidobacterium longum, there's a strain BB536 that is commercially available. These have been this has been tested in human clinical trials. In adults, it decreases the symptoms of cedar pollen allergy. In children, it decreases the risk of respiratory infection. Taking BB536 increases the level of Fecalobacterium prasnitzi, according to a clinical trial. Now, that wasn't done in COVID-19. It was done um, in, in healthy uh, adults who had evidence of inflammation in their body. But this F. prausnitzi, as I mentioned, is depleted in COVID-19, also in Crohn's disease and in CFS ME. It's one of the things that long COVID and, and ME have in common. Now, Bacillus subtilis B7092. This comes from the Soviet Union was isolated from Siberian tundra in the 1960s, developed by Soviet scientists as an immune boosting probiotic. It releases alpha interferon. Now, that makes it interesting to me in the context of COVID-19 because alpha interferon is antiviral and the SARS-CoV-2 virus is exquisitely sensitive to being killed by alpha interferon. In fact, one of the ways that it is able to establish infection is by silencing your body's mechanisms for producing alpha interferon. So Bacillus subtilis B7092 is a way of introducing orally an external source of alpha interferon. Um, following the breakup of the Soviet Union, it was developed in the Ukraine under the name Subalin and in Russia under the name Vetom 1.1. In the US, it's available under the name Tundrix. I've been using it for about three years in my practice, and I found it most useful for helping to restore a healthy microbiome after the treatment of GI infections. And it may also on its own combat certain viral or bacterial infections. Um, so I've used this information to put together a program that, that I use with my patients. And it's uh, it's a dynamic process. It's constantly changing. Number one, I think antibiotics should be used with caution in patients with acute COVID or long COVID because they may further disrupt the microbiome and aggravate the state of dysbiosis rather than improving it. I do use Bacillus subtilis 7092 with the idea that having alpha interferon in the gut will help to clear the virus. It's a short course of treatment. It's not an ongoing probiotic. You, I use it for about two to four weeks. Oral care to get rid of the pro-inflammatory species is something that I've recently incorporated into this program. And in doing research, I came up with two natural products that I think uh, can make a difference, neem oil and propolis. And these are available as toothpastes or powders. And their main purpose is to eliminate the inflammatory bacteria that have been associated with the persistence of symptoms. Resveratrol and curcumin, two herbs that I've spoken about, herbal extracts that I've spoken about before um, and are part of my core protocol for COVID because they boost, boost 
ACE2 activity are also useful here because they've been shown to inhibit the growth of Enterococcus fecalis. And there are many ways to inhibit the growth of yeast. The one that I like the most is berberine. It's um, an alkaloid that's extracted from a variety of herbs because it helps to balance blood sugar. It has anti-inflammatory effects of its own. Um, and it has antifungal effects without acting like an antibiotic. For maintenance, so, so this is the initial protocol that I use to help people restore their microbiome. And I like to start it when they have acute COVID, but the people who consult me who have, who have gotten over acute COVID, they're dealing with long COVID, I'll do that initially, maybe for three or four weeks. And then for maintenance care going ahead, prebiotics to support the growth of anti-inflammatory bacteria and at the same time boost gut immunity. The two that I um, use the most and they're readily and widely available are arabinogalactan, which comes from um, birch bark and galacto-oligosaccharides, which comes from milk. And it is possible to get a human milk, galacto-oligosaccharides. Um, probiotics for enhancing butyrate synthesis and the growth of Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. Bifidobacterium longum, BB536 is at the top of my list. Um, there is a study showing that a soil-based organism that's pretty widely available called Bacillus coagulans also enhance, enhances Fecalobacterium prausnitzi. Sometimes I will actually have people take butyrate in addition. Sodium butyrate would, could be considered a postbiotic and because it's a product of a healthy microbiome. And this is to enhance butyrate levels in the intestines in the tissues. Um, now, I found it essential that the protocols that I use with patients are individualized. I mean, that's just my basic approach. One of the complications of COVID-19 is there are some people who are left hypersensitive and allergic. Um, and this may be due to mast cell activation or the development of histamine intolerance. Mast cells are these primitive immune cells that are involved in allergies, but also in the defense against infection. And they are widely scattered in your tissues. They don't circulate in your blood. And they are recruited into the defense against COVID-19. And there are some people, and it's probably for genetic reasons, in whom the, the mast cells don't turn off. They secrete about 200 different chemicals, including histamine. They're the major source of histamine in the body. And so if you have chronic GI symptoms, which could include pain and diarrhea, if you're not able to tolerate the components of this program that um, I've just described, uh, and, and if you have things like redness or swelling, blood clotting, allergic or pseudo-allergic symptoms, hypersensitivity to all sorts of things that you take, including pressure, temperature, um, then you, you really need to consider the possibility of mast cell activation as a consequence of COVID-19. There's several approaches to that, and that could be a whole additional presentation or discussion. There are some probiotics that are helpful with the um, probiotics are very tricky because some release histamine, but others break down histamine. Um, and um, there, there are a couple of preparations that I've found uh, to be very helpful for that. The other thing is that um, histamine breakdown um, is dependent upon an enzyme that contains copper. It's called diamine oxidase. Now, a lot of people with COVID-19 are taking zinc because that's kind of part of the, um, the folklore that's out there that zinc is antiviral, so you should take lots of zinc if you have COVID-19. And certainly if you're, if you're zinc deficient, I think it's worthwhile. But if you take too much zinc, you will deplete copper. And you need copper for 
breaking down histamine. Um, looking at copper zinc balance, looking at the levels of um, diamine oxidase, if that's available to you. I think that can be done in the UK, by the way. And, um, uh, and considering whether there may be mast cell activation, I think it is important if you're not able to tolerate the regimens that other people or the programs that other people can tolerate. Thank you very much. I think it's incredible information that you have shared just now. Just very uh, maybe simple question uh, to that would be, you have this uh, protocols developed for people and you mentioned that diet uh, is an important part of it. So we know that bacteria, good or bad, can contribute to immune system. Now, could you give any idea what sort of diet people should stick to to feed this good bacteria growing crowd than bad bacteria okay. destroying immune system? Okay, again, just because something is good doesn't mean that it's going to help you or that you'll be able to do it. But I, I would say the basic dietary principles that we all know, uh, well, I'll, I'll go a little bit beyond that. The healthiest diet for the gut microbiome is a high fiber, high polyphenol diet. That is lots of vegetables, um, fruits like berries, um, nuts and seeds. Um, those all make an important contribution to shaping a healthy microbiome. The, there are some people who need animal protein and there are other people who thrive without it. There are some people who really need um, higher carbo, who need grains. Um, they'll just lose too much weight without grains. There are people who, who thrive on high fat diets and people who thrive on low fat diets. So, so you have to get to know your body and how it responds to food. Um, uh, but the basic principle in the, from the perspective of the microbiome and curating it is fiber and polyphenols, um, uh, flavonoids in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, um, beyond that, if there are specific food sensitivities that you have, um, foods that make you sick or feel worse, you should avoid them, not only because you feel worse when you eat them. I mean, you know, there may be people who say, well, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway because I enjoy it while it's happening. <laughs> I mean, humans do that. But, um, but because the inflammatory reaction that is created by those foods increases the leakiness of the gut and creates a state of inflammation in the intestine that will lead to dysbiosis. And if you really balance um, your gut bacteria well over time, often a lot of these food sensitivities will improve. And I've seen, uh, I mean, it doesn't happen immediately. It's not like taking a drug, but over a period of six months or more, I've seen really dramatic decrease in long established food sensitivity with major dietary change that altered the gut microbiome in a positive way. And, and there've been researchers who have established that in, in autoimmune diseases, for example. A low histamine diet may be needed if you have developed histamine intolerance or mast cell activation with the release of lots of histamine. And that's something you'll need to work out for yourself. There are a lot of tools for doing that. Well, thank you for, uh, for this information. And uh, I would like to say my huge thank you for helping people during COVID and post-COVID by using and developing these functional medicine protocols uh, as a way to help reduce these symptoms. And I'm sure our listeners would appreciate this information and share it among other practitioners because this is our aim. So we want to educate sufferers at the same time, share these resources among practitioners. So thank you very much for this interview. I hope you enjoy it and we'll speak to you later. <laughs> well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this information. It's always a pleasure speaking with you.
Thank you and goodbye. Bye.